है Investing in corruption. We know everything. We can prove nothing. We want you to go in there as our agent. Get us our evidence. This is where you'll be going. An island fortress, really. Sterling Silliphant called me up one day and she says, Have you met, have you met, you, you know Bruce Lee? I said, who, no, I, I don't know Bruce Well, he's the greatest there is, uh, absolutely greatest instructor, he's, 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 he's brilliant, that, you gotta meet him. I said, oh, well, uh, <clears throat> yeah, sure, okay, I'll, I'll meet him, you know. We were just getting started and uh, had, having been executives at Warner Brothers, and Sterling Sullivan and James Coburn came to us with a script called The Silent Flute that Sterling had written for Bruce to star in. And then Bruce and I became great friends. I mean, we went out, we went to dinner, we talked about martial arts, he showed me some of the films, and I got very interested in the Chinese fighting thing which never came over to America. And we couldn't get anybody who weren't as interested in doing it. Nobody was interested, really, in a... Chinese lead. And he, you know, he was really anxious to become a, a, an American television star. He wanted to be a star. I mean, it was, he was just driven to be to that stardom. I said, there is no way, Bruce, that you're going to ever get uh, to really be seen here in America unless you have a piece of film. And it's not just the Green Hornet, that's television. Bruce was too much for television. I mean, he was, he was bigger than television. So when Raymond Chow offered him the, uh, I think it was the Big Boss, it was called the first one, he said, well, I'm getting a little bit. I said, take it. And uh, he went back to Hong Kong because he didn't get the role in Kung Fu. After Bruce went back to Hong Kong, he became miraculously successful. I mean, he became like the Beatles, that overnight hit in the Far East. He had never achieved that before at any time. It was on television where uh, they, I guess they had a, a, a group of uh, martial artists and they were all breaking uh, ice and bricks with their heads and with their elbows and everything. And they asked Bruce, uh, who was sitting there looking askance at all of that, and said, well, what do you think about all of this? Well, I think that he can break ice with his elbow or that he can break bricks. Well, what does that have to do with anything? That doesn't really, well, okay, Mr. Smart Ass, uh, let's see what you can do. And he says, no, I don't do any demonstrations. And they, everybody in the audience went, la, 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 la. And uh, so he says, uh, okay, okay, just wrap up three of those square boards, foot wide, and put some tape on them. And so he uh, yelled it out there and he dropped it and side kicked it and it shattered. It just blew it. It went up in the lights and the lights went pow, pow, pow. And Bruce was so, he said, I was so shocked because he'd never done that thing before. It was just something that came to his mind. Pow! You know, he acted his way back to his chair <laughs> like nothing had happened. I mean, after that, you know, of course, Run Run Shaw and Raymond Chow and everybody started vying for his, you know, his attention. Bruce and I spent a lot of time, went out. Bruce was interested in the project, there was no question. Raymond, on the other hand, was soft. And why was Raymond soft? Because he didn't, he was making so much money on the pictures, he still wanted to have complete control and everything. So Raymond said, well, it's a shame it's not going to work, so we'll have dinner tonight. And so we went out to a Japanese restaurant. And we sat down for dinner, and as we're going through the meal, I said, Bruce, I'm leaving tomorrow. He said, why? I said, well, it's obvious that Raymond doesn't want you to be an international star. He understands that you're great as a local chop sake guy, but Raymond doesn't. And he turned around to Raymond and said, make the deal. <laughs> At which point the next day, Raymond made the deal. We have found this young writer who had no real credits, but it's somebody that I had had an eye on for a while. And then, Paul, you got this cockamamie writer who I had never heard of, who you love, <laughs> Michael Allen. You called me in and you said, you've got this wonderful, amazing guy named Bruce Lee. He makes movies in Hong Kong. You've never seen anything like it. 
guess what? I want you to write a movie for him. And he came up and he turned out a wonderful first first draft. It was wonderful because I didn't know anything about martial arts. I didn't know anything about Hong Kong. And I was learning along the way. We, we really blocked it out. It was so exciting. And I'll tell you how it, the kind of energy we had on it. We did the first draft of the screenplay in three weeks, which is unheard of. It happened so quickly because um, I think that Bruce was getting so hot. And he'd gone back to Hong Kong, I think, in 71, and virtually in less than a year, he, he, he couldn't walk down the street. He was, he was a major Asian star in Hong Kong. He knew that if he kept making Chinese chop sakis, he could stay in China the rest of his life. And he was anxious to show Coburn and McQueen and all the rest that he was an international, you know, star. We wanted to present him as, as this, as this incredible, like, force of nature. It was designed and, and executed for a particular star in a genre, and it had a real purity in that sense. But he needed to be one of three. He needed to be the coolest of, of three heroes. And we worked very hard, consciously creating an international kind of movie for, that would present Bruce properly. Well, when we got started, and there was very little time to do all these things, and the script had been sort of roughed in, and we knew a little bit about what we needed, we really needed to get some sets built if we were going to ever make the schedule. And when I was a kid, I grew up with this comic strip called Terry and the Pirates. And Terry and the Pirates was about China and the Orient and the mystery and dragon ladies. It was high chroma reds, blues, golds, and it just lent itself to this project so so closely. Well, I brought in a sketch artist I knew named Dale Hennessy. Dale and I sat down and, and worked out the basic sets for the piece. The biggest one of all, the full studio size set, was the cave. Some of the prison areas where Bruce got caught in the cell and the doors clanging down. And then in the other studio, the banquet hall. These are large sets that need a lot of thought. We put together enough material for me to bring over to Hong Kong and turn over to the Chinese designers. And they in turn took it and interpreted it. And I think did an outstanding job. I think what Bob Klaus, the director, and I tried to do was to take the magical element of Hong Kong and bring a photographic style to that. Sometimes you'd uh, look down a hallway and not see anybody until they came into the light. And I remember Bob was very insistent that he wanted it to be absolute black and then come into the light. And lighting wise, that, that's kind of a challenge. Rather than light the whole cave, we use pools of lighting to try to make it very dramatic. We use smoke to sort of haze it out. Uh, Bob did this very uh, neat shot from up above, and looking at it, it was kind of blah. It was just a bunch of people walking around on there. So someone had the idea to get like a hundred bird cages, so we'd shoot through the bird cages. So you couldn't really see what was going on. You didn't really know who these people were, what was going to happen. So what we tried to do, lighting-wise, is to add to that, to, to make it dramatic, to make it exotic. Freddie and I talked about this at length, and the big problem is how do you have a film loaded with action in a contemporary situation where the hero has no guns? Now, why doesn't somebody pull a 45 and bang, settle it? No, no guns. Han would never allow guns on the island anyway. He had a bad experience with them once, and he's fearful of assassination. Can't really blame him. Any bloody fool can pull a trigger. I guess I won't need anything. And the villain creates the hero. You need a really sensational, I wanted Han to be the devil. Gentlemen, welcome. You honor our island. But the devil who believed in something was dedicated to, which is the worst kind of villain. We create ourselves through long years of rigorous training, sacrifice, denial, pain. We put into work an idea, which we clear with Dick Marr at first, of Hans Island. Hans Island never really existed. I mean, it 
We needed to establish an island in the film. One of the actors was the pilot. We took off in his little single engine plane, took the door off, I got my camera out, and we started taking pictures of islands, took pictures of mansions, and put them all together into one composite photograph that became the Hans Island of the film. The pilot of the plane was Roy Chow, who played the monk in the monastery at the opening. And by the way, we shot that on a tennis court. Well, we found this series of step tennis courts that were just marvelous. But nobody notices, if you look closely in the film, you'll notice the lines on the greenery. We had to paint them all over with green. I mean, they don't look like tennis courts. They look like fields where a man like Han would be working with his army of martial artists. I was used to crews from Hollywood um, that were very experienced. And so the crew was like the equipment, taking a step back in time. The lab we used for developing the film was the filthiest place I've ever seen. Cobwebs hanging, dust inches thick. How we got a film that looks like the film we got out of there, I will never know. And the tools for lighting were very simple. In, in Hollywood, you had a lot of tools to control lights. And, and over there, I think we had window screens, black paper, rope, and clothespin. I think the most difficult part of it was that we had come up with a very ambitious film, and we worked very hard to pull it off. The whole electrical crew didn't speak any English, and so I tried to get a communication going there. When we started, all we had was Chinese crews. So I, I got about 10 words of Chinese and, and wrote them on a little card, you know, like turn the light on, turn the light off. The whole process was slower than we had hoped for. I mean, the, the biggest problem was communication. Obviously my Chinese wasn't very accurate because most of the times when I would say something, they just thought it was the funniest thing in the world. As we went along, we learned about the crew, they learned about us, and we came up with a very positive way of making things work. But we had a very good time, and they were very hard working, and, and once we actually started doing things where we would turn a light on, and I would go over and show them what we wanted, they were very accommodating. The skill of the Chinese craftsmen working at things that they knew how to do was just outstanding. Bob had an idea for the island when we came there to sort of fill up the frame with a lot of flags. So we had some flags made and then we needed some flag poles. Well, there weren't any. So we had them made. I never ceased to be amazed when this old man came in with a bag of plaster, some sticks and wire. And at the end of the day, there'd be a four-foot temple dragon or a six-foot statue of a Chinese warrior. And they just did a wonderful job. I mean, the casting of the film was really kind of amazing. We selected John Saxon because we had heard that he was very interested in martial arts. The interest in karate was spreading all over the place. That was the reason why I decided to do it. I was surprised at how good he was. Yeah. Talking over how to do the scene in the golf course with uh, Bob Klaus and, and Fred Weintraub, I felt I had to demonstrate to them what I meant. So I began doing all kinds of leaping kicks that I could do at that time, you know, scissor kicks and so on. I know he worked really hard during the shooting. But I felt that I had sufficient preparation, I thought, to do a movie, you know. Um, I was a little uh, overestimation. Yeah, well, I, I think when he got to Hong Kong, he, he really saw these guys working, and he was working every day. It was, I think, about eight days of continuous fight scene stuff. I gotta tell you, but after those eight days, I had had enough of doing the karate movie. I didn't want to do any more of these fight scenes. I thought, come on, give me back to something that is a drama, that is an internal thing, an emotional sort of situation. Um, I was glad it was over in, in, in those eight days, yeah. Bruce had a lot to say. He had a lot of recommendations in terms of the martial artists, and we, we kind of deferred to him in the final choice because he'd be the one to work with them in their martial arts areas. He had worked with most of these guys in America. Bob knew Bruce, I guess, from competition. Bruce's and my relationship was slow in developing. Um, in a way, we kind of had a tease each other, almost to say smart 
phallic things to each other, kind of a relationship for quite a while. There's no question there was some, there was a competitiveness there. In the shooting of the film, when that accident with the, with the broken glass happened, it got way blown out of proportion. We shot that scene several times, eight times to be exact, the particular scene with the broken bottles. The problem was, believe it or not, a very simple thing. They didn't have breakaway glass in Hong Kong at that time. And then, you know, rumors feed on themselves. They don't have to have a lot of substance. They use regular glass in all their movies. And so I, each time we'd shoot the scene, I'd have to break the real bottles. Uh, and Bruce instructed me to take the jagged edge of my right hand, which I had one in each hand, but lunge with the right hand at his right pet and Bruce's words were, come at me as fast as you can. And Bruce insisted that the action be so realistic. And he wanted to get it perfect. Everything had to be perfect with Bruce. It was a fraction of an inch and Bruce got cut. And it was lightning fast. I mean, I just lunged as fast as I could, whap, it was over. And Bruce had his right hand up and he started to spin. And as he spun, he jammed his fist into the glass. Now, it truly was an accident. Truly an accident that we were both there. On the set, I saw it. You know, I told him how sorry I was that I was involved. He said, it's not your fault. Uh, just one of those things that happened. One of the most interesting things about the selection of the actors was how we finally got Jim Kelly. It was really a, a last minute thing because what had happened is we had another actor signed on to do it. Two days before we were ready to leave, this martial artist, actor, decided he wasn't going to go. And so, uh, we had to find somebody else. We went to the studio and to saw studio Jim working. Down yeah, Crenshaw, I think it was. Yeah. And at night we went down there and we saw Jim Kelly working. He looked great. And uh, two days later, he was on the he plane. He was on the plane. <laughs> you know what was going on? And it was fast. One of my most favorite players was Angela Mao, who played Bruce's sister. She was so petite, so darling. And what a martial artist. And uh, we, uh, we saw her in a film that she had played the lead in when we were in Hong Kong. And when the, she was presented to us, we flipped over. And uh, she was so cooperative and such a good actress. Paul and I, we just saw this guy. He just looked so wonderful. And then he took his shirt off. You know, he had to be in the movie. Well, Peter Archer was in Hong Kong, I believe, at the time that we made the film. And that's where I came in. I was, I was a local martial artist and a foreigner on the spot. But he was really quite good, and I loved the scene in the boat. There was a, there was a boat scene on a junk heading out of Aberdeen Harbour, and one of the things that this particular scene called for was for me to jump the, off the deck of the junk and into this little dinghy. I think I was out there on the boat at that time. Yeah, you were. You I was were out the there, and, I, and Bruce was really pissed at him a little. Something had happened between the two of them. But I was being towed behind the, the junk at the end of a, a long rope. And he wasn't supposed to stay out there that long on the boat. And Bruce made the kids not bring him in so fast. And this. Uh, chap on the bullhorn on the back of the junk was saying, pull on the rope, pull on the rope, get mad. So I'm shaking my fist and pulling on the rope at the same time as the bow of the dinghy was disappearing under the waves. So. Whatever happened to the boy? Hung away, the, the boy who played the little boy from the monastery. Whatever happened to him? He's a director now. He, he's an he's a important director in Hong Kong. Uh... 其實就是這樣的,因為我們最初我們是做Stun的,有一個叫關照人師父,他說他們在香港的時候是一個後生仔,做一個這樣的演員,就找了我去了,我本身是Stun的,我很小個,做Stun的去了,試了,給個導演看
you know, they're finished, they were very funny, very happy. Ah, I'm, I'm in a hurry. Okay, okay, go, go. Take my passport, you know. Well, we saved the dragon lady for last, Anna Capri. And we're very fortunate because Anna took some home movies while she was making the film. Back in those days, I loved going on location, and I had told my agent that at that particular time, I wanted to go anywhere on location because my mom had just passed away, and I, was, I would welcome the opportunity to work out of town. And my agent called me up, and he said, uh, you said you wanted to go to look on location. He said, is Hong Kong far enough? And I just laughed. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, there's a film called Enter the Dragon, and it's starring uh, a martial artist called Bruce Lee. He says, have you ever heard of him? And I said, I have never heard of Bruce Lee, nor martial arts. He said to me, would you like to go to Hong Kong? And I said, absolutely. So I said, well, good. When should I go? And he said, uh, tonight. I said, no way. And I said, well, what's the part? He says, I don't have a frigging idea. But he said, you know, they'll send you the script, packer, and the luggage. Just get on that plane. I somehow miraculously was on that plane going to Hong Kong that night at midnight. China Airlines. My dad had given me a, a little Super 8 camera for my birthday, which was like a couple months before I went, and I just threw it in the bag just to keep, pass the time, just walking around and, you know, taking some shots of Bruce and John and the Jim Kelly and Bob Wall. Of course, I'm sorry that I didn't have more. We just spliced five three-minute increments together so it would be easier to view, to show my friends. And like I said, it was just for fun. And it wasn't really from the beginning, middle, and end. It was mostly just you know, where they were filming the tournament scenes. And when they first arrived, that was just down the steps from where we shot the tournament scenes. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting because I had been invited to a formal lunch at this uh, rich palatial estate. It was on a Sunday afternoon and I went and the lunch was basically held on a boat which was down the steps from this palace. I noticed that these yellow flags were flapping in the wind. I asked the, the, our host, I said, what are all those yellow flags doing there? And he said to me, tomorrow uh, some movie company is going to start shooting here for the next two to three weeks and it's a film starring Bruce Lee. And I said, I can't believe that. I said, I'm the leading lady in that role, I mean, in that movie. And he said, you're kidding. I said, no. I said, and we're gonna start shooting here tomorrow. It, it, but it was mysteriously wonderful and beautiful at the same time. I mean, I was fascinated with it. I loved Hong Kong. Well, the interesting thing is when we started the film, Bruce was so nervous, he didn't want to, he didn't want to start. We started shooting the picture and Bruce did not show up. And what we had heard is that he was nervous, and he was nervous. Meanwhile, we started shooting the movie because I wanted to get going, and we had Warner's money, and the guy from Warner Brothers kept coming. I said, oh, I'm telling you, it's really turning out great. I didn't have a bit of footage on, on, on Bruce. Fred, too, was going around the hills of Hong Kong shooting scenics and car rides and everything to get before we could get Bruce into the studio. And the first scene that he did in the studio he was so nervous and so physically shaking. We shot the scene where he's sitting down in a chair and they had just sort of turned his head. It's the only action we gave him. And then finally he got it and I said, Bob, you gotta keep going now. And then from then on, Bruce, not only was with it, like everything Bruce did, he became terrific in what he did. Great film coordinator, you know, stunt coordinator. And ultimately what we did in the screenplay was when we came upon an action sequence which was going to be a, a Bruce Lee kind of showpiece, we were just writing the script, choreography to be designed by the director and the star. A lot of Bruce's talent was with working with other actors and choreographing a scene and leading the whole operation, both in what he did and, and in what happened with other people in the fight. And a lot of it, uh, again, with the director, the director had, Bob, Bob Klaus, had a wonderful sense of action. and He really had a wonderful visual eye to what, what would make a good action scene. When I saw the fight 
downstairs when he goes into the caves. I thought when we saw that, the kind of things that Bruce was doing was unusual and different. And he also had great charisma. And you know, you watch the other stunt guys watch Bruce, you begin to understand what happened. I mean, you know, remember Jackie Chan was a, a stunt man on Enter the Dragon. Everybody began to understand that this was something unusual. And we were starting to get the feel, and being in Hong Kong and seeing the way the people, you know, considered him a hero, you were caught up in it. And when Bruce liked something, when Bruce saw something, he was very inventive. You know, we'd walk through the sets and we built these kind of marvelous sets. And as we'd find something, as he'd see something, he was very, very absolutely genius at finding a way to incorporate everything within it into his fight sequences. See, what was a great thing is it was also a work in progress. As we saw things, we added that to give color to Michael Allen's script. I, I sort of ran across the phenomena in a little hotel in Hong Kong on Repulse Bay. On the way to the men's room having lunch there, there was this sort of multiple paneled mirror and I just looked in it and I said, wow, this is amazing. And I took Bruce and showed it to him and he thought it was too fragmented that you couldn't get any action that would mean anything out of it. And Bob Klaus and I really fought hard for it and we created this mirrored room. Well, the mirrored room was a great idea. It was very visual. We built it, and uh, and then we walked some people through it and showed Bruce how it looked. And then he got absolutely... So we wanted to see ourselves. We just built like a closet in the middle of the room that was movable with mirrors on the outside. It just blended into the other mirrors. I, I remember that I would always have to touch because if I'm looking at something, they might not be there. They might be over there. Each angle was so carefully laid out in terms of where people appeared and mirror images appeared. I mean, we'd be doing a shot of Shikin and all of a sudden Bruce would appear in the back. And of course that image was maybe six reflections. There was no place you could go that you would, any reflection might not be seen. So I found that I could only be in there for a couple hours and I'd have to go out and sit down and look at a wall in real dimension because it's like there was a fourth dimension in there which was unbelievable to work in. All of a sudden, I get a call from Fred Whiteo, one of the producers. He says, Bruce Lee is in town. He wants to have lunch with you. I wanted to meet him, but I didn't know what to talk to him. Well, Lalo had done that marvelous score for uh, Mission Impossible. And then he said, the reason I wanted to meet you is that I practice in my dojo in Hong Kong with the rhythm of your music of Mission Impossible. He had the most unusual instruments. When he, he found things that we used in Enter the Dragon that hadn't really been used much in orchestration. So I had to invent sounds based on instruments that they are accessible to the studio musician that would sound like from the audience. We wanted it to be modern, but to have a little Chinese, but not have a Chinese score. And I, I accomplished that. That was a great satisfaction. The near at Groundlands was uh, exciting and sad at the same moment. Of course, Bruce had passed away by then. Before the opening, we had had a Chinese dragon race down Hollywood Boulevard. Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. Remember that? One dragon from San Francisco Go and on. one dragon from L.A. But it was all due to Bruce. I mean, it's, you have to understand, everything emanated from the fact that we caught a star. And uh, I don't mean star, movie star, I mean a, a comet. A comet, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And uh, it was a shame that he wasn't there at the opening to see it. The regret that I think we have at this moment is that Bob Klaus isn't here with us anymore to be part of this. Without Bob, I don't think Enter the Dragon would have been the film it is and certainly would have been nothing without Bruce. Bob had a gentleness and, and an ability to see what, what Bruce could do.